It's April 19th, 1956, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Before there was Meghan Markle, there was another movie star who became a real-life princess. And she was a much bigger movie star, frankly, but, you know, less significant (laughs) princess. So six of one, half dozen of the other. I speak, of course, of Grace Kelly, who became Her Serene Highness Princess Grace of Monaco, today in history in 1956, when she married Prince Rainier III. Yeah, she was obviously one of the most beautiful stars of the era and he looked a bit like the dad from Mary Poppins. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was charming, he was cultured and he was the visionary of modern Monaco. At the time it was kind of a sleepy, louche casino resort for Europe's wealthy elite. He came up with the idea of it as being a tax haven as Yay. well. <laughs> <laughs> and so this day was actually the culmination of eight days of celebrations uh, and a two-day wedding. Uh, the ceremony the ceremony which was held at St Nicholas Cathedral was attended by 600 guests, including Ava Gardner, Cary Grant and Gloria Swanson. During the wedding breakfast, by the way, guests were treated to lobster caviar and then this six-tier wedding cake uh, by the Hotel de Paris pastry chefs, from which two live turtle doves were released after Rainier <laughs> sliced through it with a sword. And I was like, that could have gone so disastrously Ooh, so wrong. Bad. That, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, you do not want to be in the room when... The prince accidentally cuts off the head of the ceremonial dove. (laughs) The whole thing was being filmed by MGM, Grace Kelly's studio, uh, and was billed, like, everywhere as the wedding of the century. Mm. Although, of course, as regular listeners know, that was yet to come when Princess Anne married Mark Phillips. (laughs) Um, Grace herself called it the carnival of the century, though, which I think hints at her kind of dual personality Mm. here. She is a big star. She likes being a big star. She likes being the centre of attention. She's legendarily beautiful. She is getting married on television to a prince. And yet there's just something of a sense that maybe on some level she doesn't want to be there. People now commenting on the footage from Pathé News on YouTube are all, are all basically saying, no, it's not sadness. She doesn't look sad. I, she's very serious because she's a staunch Catholic. Or, you know, I was I looked sad on my wedding day, but I, I love the man I was marrying. It's like, why do you keep justifying that she does look a bit unhappy? <laughs> yeah. <when> she does. <laughs> yeah, well, a big part of that came from the extreme scrutiny that every single moment was under, particularly because it was being filmed by MGM, which was not something that she wanted. She needed to be released from her contract early. This was in the days when stars were still, you know, tied to studio contracts. And it had been made very clear to her, and she had agreed that she could not juggle her career as a movie star with being a princess. She was going to renounce her movie career. She had already made her last film, High Society, in which you can see her gigantic Cartier diamond engagement ring on her finger in character. And in exchange for releasing her early, obviously would have been bad publicity for MGM to hold this future princess hostage, she had had to agree that they would film the ceremony and it would be broadcast live. In return as well, they did make her her wedding dress. The MGM costume designer Helen Rose worked with 36 seamstresses for six weeks on the gown. It is great when you look at it. It, it is looks fantastic. Gown. It's in my top 10 gowns. Yeah. Easy. <laughs> it, it would look great on you. It includes 274 <laughs> metres of lace and 91 metres of silk. I mean, it's a miracle that she could walk in it. I'm thinking, how can one human woman carry like 300 metres worth of material? But I think that that's part of why she probably wasn't enjoying herself as as well as all of the scrutiny as well as all of like the weirdness of how her life must have been set to change from this moment and she would have known it but Rainier once told his biographer Jeffrey Robinson it wasn't fun and in the middle of the turmoil Grace kept saying maybe we should run off to a small chapel somewhere in the mountains and finish getting married there he said I wish we had because there was no way either she or I could really enjoy what was happening which really doesn't does fly in the face of everything you imagine people would want when they think about the idea of maybe marrying into the royal family and enjoying all of the pomp and the ceremony, particularly of the wedding day. Like it's the wedding day that people are fixated on, not the happily ever after. Mm. I think that seems sort of like the domestic bit that's likely to go wrong. Yeah, and actually, when you look at the details of this, you realise that there is more under the surface than there appears. For one thing, they'd already had a civil ceremony, so they were actually married at this point Mm. anyway. This was kind of being done for the cameras, really. Also, the relationship underneath it, I mean, there's no suggestion that they didn't at least like each other a lot, but at the same time, Grace Kelly was actually uh, engaged to someone else 
when she met Prince Rainier, uh, the fashion designer Oleg Cassini. Details, details. <laughs> <laughs> and she met Rainier because uh, she was posing for a magazine cover with him at the Cannes Film Festival in 1955. They were then courting for two weeks, despite her being engaged to someone else, and then he popped the question. So you do have to ask, OK, what's going on behind the scenes here? Why are they being set up together on a magazine? Why are they engaged so quickly? Why does she leave this man that she obviously does love to go with this guy that she kind of likes? And it is actually, it seems, the mechanics of monarchy, as ever has been the case. Like, it reminds me a little bit of, like, the stuff we've done about the Elizabethan court mm. when you read what was going on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Rainier himself was used goods by this point as well. Prior to meeting Grace, he had been in a long-term relationship with another actress, French film star Giselle Pascal, and they even lived together. The relationship then fell apart, partly due to the pressure of the fact that she was never going to be accepted as an appropriate bride. And then the kind of the icing on the cake was that Rainier had this really odd sister, very eccentric, called Antoinette, who was very determined to get her own son on the throne of Monaco. And she spread all these false rumours that Pascal was infertile, which would have made her ineligible anyway. And but 1950s we're talking about here. Yeah. yeah, I know. You know, can you produce an heir? Yeah. That's what this is. Yeah. yeah, well, even before the wedding, Grace Kelly herself had to undergo a medical examination that was supposed to determine whether she was fertile or not. And she apparently was bricking it because she knew it would reveal that she wasn't a virgin, which technically wasn't allowed either. But in the end, that part of the report was kind of glossed <laughs> over. That, that bit got lost somewhere. But there were also <laughs> reports that uh, Rainier was kind of just looking for a Hollywood bride, any Hollywood bride. And mm. this was because, you know, tourism was low to Monaco and his advisors had allegedly at least suggested that he should marry a Hollywood actress to, quote, save Monaco. And in fact, according to the Telegraph in London, Rainier's friend Aristotle Onassis first suggested Marilyn Monroe as a suitable wife for the prince. Oh. Monroe herself <laughs> allegedly was convinced that she'd be able to win the prince, she said, give me two days alone with him and of course he'll want to marry me. Um, but she just wasn't interested and so that didn't go ahead. Meanwhile, the speculation is that Grace Kelly may also have been looking for something different because this was kind of the the moment in her career where she'd seen a bunch of the downsides of life in the spotlight. You know, she really had been hounded and mistreated by the press and after winning an Oscar for The Country Girl, her personal life was just under this constant scrutiny, especially because there were rumours that she was having relationships with her co-stars like Clark Gable and Gary Cooper and so on. And also she was grossly underpaid. So in To Catch a Thief, for example, she was paid just $5,000 while Cary Grant was paid 18000 And she was paid only 750 a week for Magambo while Gable was paid 5000 per week. She wasn't short of a bob or two, though. She did come into the marriage with a $2 million dowry, yeah. half of which from her own income as a Hollywood star and half from her inheritance. She came from a very prominent Philadelphia family. And crucially as well, they were a Catholic family. And she was, well, she's described as a devout Catholic. But, I mean, she had a pretty exciting dating history. Apparently one of her conquests was the Shah of Iran. So wow. she obviously had a certain fascination for <laughs> royal families. <laughs> Apparently, what Anassis had told the prince was, quote, the right bride could do for Monaco's tourism what the coronation of Queen Elizabeth did for Great Britain. <laughs> this is only three years after the coronation, so I wonder if, in a way, I mean, she's an actress, maybe that austere face that she's pulling in the wedding video is a bit like, I'm going to be the queen now, you mm. know? I'm going to channel what we've all just seen. And underneath all of that... The very right of the very right of the prince to be the prince at all, because Monaco's independence agreement with France did rule that Monaco would revert to French control if the Grimaldi royal family failed to produce an heir. Wow. So I mean, you know, stakes are actually quite high. He did seem like, in some ways, a decent husband. He doesn't seem like the worst of people that you could possibly be married to in the you know sort of pantheon of princes. Um, and by the time she died tragically at the age of fifty-two, when her car fell off a mountain road, he really did seem very, very affected by her death. You know, there, there was a form of love in this relationship. They did appear to love each other. 
And in a way, you know, the tragic circumstances of her premature death did cement her as this romantic heroine, you know, in the legacy of Monaco's history. Nowhere is that more captured than in the glamour of this wedding day that did grip the world, you know, 30 million people tuning in. Everyone would have been totally smashed on the cocktail that was made in the couple's honour, the princess cocktail, which was equal parts bourbon, grenadine and fresh cream. (laughs) Just the most (laughs) vomitous uh, possible combination. <laughs> Summit pumps are also tax free in Monte Carlo. Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow. He was like, actually, I think I might just turn around and get out of here as soon as I can. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, part of the ACAS Creator Network.